Hello everyone, my name's Adam and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at the filler base kit from Filler Farm. It's a heated bed kit assembly with a magnetic switchable plate and a print surface. So what is the filler base kit? Well, it's kind of a number of different parts that all come together. You can buy the individual bits separately on the website or you can buy them as a whole kit. So what it includes is firstly the print surface. There's a number of different ones to choose from. You get a spring steel plate. You get the magnetic surface. You get the tool plate. You get the silicon heater. And you get an SSR, which is a solid state relay, which is basically like a kind of electronic switch for controlling the heat bed. Now you know what all the bits are, let's go through them in a little bit more detail, tell you a little about what they are and also why I chose these for the extrudinator. So firstly, the tool plate aluminium. So this is the tool plate, this six millimeter piece of aluminium in here, just below the magnetic sheet. So this is a fairly expensive form of aluminium, but it's for a good reason. Firstly, the flatness from filler farm that you get on this aluminium plate is less than 0.1 millimeters, which means it's exceptionally flat, which is obviously good for a large flat surface, which you need for your 3D printer bed. Secondly, tool plate aluminium, which is what this is, is cast and then machined. So in order to get this flat sheet, you don't kind of make it off a roller and just squish it out and then cut it to the size that you want. It's cast into a shape and then cut up and machined to a flat surface. The reason this is generally better than a rolled material is that this won't warp over time. So when you have a traditional rolled material, because of that rolling process, you get like, they, they call them residual stresses in the material, which means there's stresses that can act should the material reach a certain state. As you thermal cycle, so heat and cool and heat and cool your material, which in this case is the print bed, which of course will be heated and cooled over time. Those residual stresses, which are acting inside the material, end up very slightly different and just end up pulling in certain different ways, which results in the material no longer being flat. It will warp very slightly in all sorts of different directions, depending on which direction those residual stresses are in. However, with a tool plate aluminium like this, you don't get the same residual stresses because it's not rolled, so you don't get the same warping effects over time due to temperature fluctuation. So the reason that you don't get residual stresses in a casting process is because when you're creating the main shape, the material is liquid, which means it can't form those internal stresses because there's no kind of material to act against. Everything could just freely move where it needs to move in order to result in no internal stress. So it gets poured as a liquid into a shape that's not perfectly a square or a rectangle. It'll probably be a little bit wavy and not that perfect, but there will be no internal stress because on that shaping process, the material was liquefied. Once you have that piece and it's cooled down, you can then machine it using very big, probably CNC controlled machines that have these really massive cutters and very slowly cut across the material, making it totally flat within 0.1 millimeters for a material this size, which is perfect for us because that's exactly what we need. As I already mentioned, this is aluminum tool plate. One of the great properties of aluminum is not only that it's lightweight in comparison to something like steel, but it also has a really high conductivity, thermal conductivity. So not only will you get excellent conductivity from the uh, heater through to the surface, but you'll also get a very even heat distribution across the whole plate, despite the fact that the heater doesn't necessarily go all the way to the edges. In this case, it does pretty much go all the way to the edges, but the heater traces are not gonna cover every single square millimeter, but that thick aluminum that's highly conductive will spread all that thermal energy around within itself as it distributes it to the top surface. Moving up from that tool plate, we've got the magnetic sheet. Now, there obviously are a number of different ways that you can implement flexible and magnetic sheets onto a 3D printer. This way is done using a thin sheet of magnetic material. Now, this is not necessarily the perfect method, but it is excellent for integrating into other designs or having modular and changeable designs like this one. So the way the magnetic surface mounts to the tool plate aluminium is simply with a piece of 3M adhesive. It's fairly easy to apply and you can trim it down very slightly afterwards if you don't get it perfectly square as you put it together. So that's fairly good. The material itself being magnetic has these uh, Curie temperatures and maximum working temperatures. The Curie temperature is the temperature at which the magnetic properties will be lost by that material 
and the maximum working temperature is a consistent temperature that it can keep without losing any of that magnetic property. So for this particular sheet, you can print pretty much any material that you're probably likely going to want to be printing. If you need to go any higher than that, then you might be want to start looking into an enclosed machine rather than an open one like this. On top of the magnetic sheet, we have, of course, the spring steel sheet. So spring steels are a special kind of category of steels that have a high tensile strength, meaning you can bend them a lot without actually causing any permanent deformation which is great for this application because we want to be able to bend it a lot without any permanent deformation. We want to keep it flat and keep it consistent to the bed surface that we've got, but we also need to be able to flex it in order to get prints off. And so this works perfectly for this application. This one is fairly thick, which means it's fairly robust, but can be fairly difficult to bend. However, on a bed this size, you don't necessarily need to flex it that much. And you've got this print surface on top, which we'll talk about in a moment, which also means less flexing than normal may be required. Right up on the top of the surface now, we have the filler print surface. Now, I don't actually know what this material is. I don't know what it's made of. I don't know what it's comprised of. I don't know what is included or inside. But what I can tell you is this. It has a color that's a little bit similar to PEI, but a little bit more brown. It has a bit of a texture in the surface that looks like there's some kind of weaving pattern going on inside and that does leave a very slight kind of appearance on the bottom of the print. The top of the surface is smooth apart from those very light textured parts so it does give a semi-glossy glassy finish once you remove it. It is also fairly thick and maybe a quarter of a millimeter or maybe more I'm really I'm not sure it's not like a millimeter thick but it is fairly thick and fairly durable one of the nice things about this surface is that when it's hot or being heated above like 50, 60 degrees, which you would need for PLA, it is really sticky somehow, not like to just a normal finger, but plastics. When you print onto this surface at that temperature, it is extraordinarily sticky. However, as soon as it cools down, then parts do come off really, really easily, almost to the point where you don't need the flexible sheet so for printing fairly small things on this sheet, I tend to not even remove the flexible plate. I just take the print off or just give it a little nudge and it'll come straight off. If I'm printing something much larger and given the high surface area, it doesn't come off super easily. I do just end up getting the flex plate off, giving it a little bit of a flex and it'll still come off really easily. There's no need for scrapers with a surface like this. So moving now to the underside of that tool plate, we've got the silicon heater. Now, a silicon heater doesn't mean that the heating is done by the silicon. It's just a heating element that's kind of covered in silicon, which means you can't contact the metal heating element from the outside, which not only makes it safe, but also does other things. I'm not totally sure, but it works really quite well. You attach the heater to the aluminium using a big sheet of 3M adhesive, and it's fairly easy to put on. There's no big challenges. You don't tend to really get many bubbles because it's quite a thick kind of the silicon heater is not very flexible, so it kind of switches down fairly easily. This particular heater is 450 watts and 230 volts. If you've looked at other mains powered, which is this is, heaters, then you may think that the wattage on this is actually quite low. Now, while it is maybe fairly low compared to other heaters, there is one important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at heating a aluminium sheet. The faster you heat up that material, the more difference in temperature you're going to get between your heating surface and the top surface. Now, if you know about thermal expansion, you'll know that as materials in, well, not all materials, but particularly aluminium, well, not necessarily particularly aluminium, but aluminium being one of the materials that expands very slightly as it heats up, that difference in temperature between the bottom surface and top surface will mean that you have different expansion rates or expansion amounts between the top surface and the bottom surface. So if you imagine your bottom surface or overall being very slightly longer than the top surface, you'll end up drawing a shape like that, which in case you hadn't guessed, basically means you're bending your surface due to the heat. By reducing the amount of power that you're pushing into the bed as heat or as thermal energy, you're reducing that thermal uh, 
change between the top and the bottom and therefore reducing any warping effects due to that temperature differential temperature difference between the top and the bottom so while you could have a 7 800 900 thousand watt heater if you wanted to it's powered by mains so you don't have to have a power supply it's just not advisable and really not necessary because the heat up times for something like this are still fairly reasonable a few minutes and you just reduce any chance of warping this fairly pristine bed by just heating it too quickly which just seems like a bit of a daft thing to do so yes it's not the fastest heater but i think it actually heats a fairly reasonable pace unless you're really like i don't know why you'd need to heat that much quicker than this you'd be wasting a lot of that energy elsewhere anyway 12 volt and 24 volt versions are available for the beds that filler farms sell but personally i really like using mains powered beds for one reason it means the power supply that you use oh you can't actually see it but it's just there can be lower wattage lower current and given that a lot of these power supplies unless you spend a lot on them tend to be from china and of fairly low quality it's probably worth not trying to overstress them with huge amounts of current a large heater like this at 450 watts on 12 volts would be somewhere region the region somewhere in the region of 20 amps 20 and a half 21 so that's a lot of current to put through fairly small connectors i mean yes they should be rated for that current if that's what they've been designed for and they should work but in my opinion why risk it especially on components that may not be as kind of amazing as they suggest they should be so i personally like using an ssr an ssr is a solid state relay a relay is an electronic switch so you're using voltage on one side to control the voltage or current flow on the other side so where you'd normally plug in your bed to your control board you instead plug in or plug in wire in the ssr so positive to one, negative to the other. So when the control board then emits the signal or controls the voltage for the heat bed to kind of a high state, if you like, up to 12 volts instead of at zero, then that will then turn on the relay or invert the relay to switch it on as it's a switch. And that will allow the current to flow through the other side of the SSR, which would be connected through the mains, which would mean the mains can then run to the bed. And that's how it works as a solid state relay and there's also a little light on the ssr so you know when it's set to high and should be heating or set to low and not heating remember though using mains always make sure your printer is really properly grounded probably should do that for any printer as well so i just have a an earth cable from the mains connected to the printer frame as well as to uh, various parts on the bed over here using a cable that comes through the cable chain the drag chain which just means all the different parts are well earthed so that if there was a short for any reason in the heater to the bed it would be grounded and therefore would remain safe which is of course important when working with mains so the actual kit that i have here is the cr10 kit from filler farm and i chose that for a couple of reasons one i wanted something that was about 300 millimeters square and cr10 is about 310 so that fit the bill fairly well I could have got a totally custom design from uh, filler farm which they do that's totally fine if you want a custom design you can ask them for a design and they'll make you whatever shape you want well, there are probably limitations if you want like totally squiggly weird shaped bed they'll probably go eh, we might not be able to do that or we won't do that or that'll cost you a huge amount of money but if you just want a better square that's slightly bigger or slightly smaller or a circle of whatever diameter they can do that so that's pretty good yeah so the other reason i chose the cr10 kit is that it's just kind of readily available if you want to try and build this printer you don't have to contact filler farm yourself and go i need these numbers these dimensions this power this current and this 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 is this you just buy the cr10 kit and it's everything that i have here so if you want to replicate the printer you can do so with just off the shelf parts so no faffing around and all that kind of stuff you just get the stuff that's already available perfect so why did i choose filler farm for the bed assembly for this printer well there are a few reasons firstly i've used them before i use them on steve for the bed and heater and stuff like that on that print actually no i didn't use the aluminium plate from them i made that myself from a 
supplier in the UK, but the whole heater and did I use the print surface? Don't think I did, but I did use the heater from Philofarm. So I'd used them before and the quality was good. I didn't have any real issues with it. So that was, that was great. Why not go back to someone who you've used previously? Secondly, the quality of their components does seem spot on. There's no, there don't seem to be any like weird shortcuts to try and save cost. Although they are fairly expensive, so you should bear that in mind. You are getting what you pay for, in my opinion. One of the big deals that was nice to get from Philofarm was the fact that they do a whole kit that's kind of ready to go, if you like. Obviously the CR10 kit, which is what I chose here. When you're building or designing a printer from scratch, like I did with this one, there are literally like hundreds of parts that you've got to get. And sometimes you can be chasing suppliers to go, have you sent this? Have you sent that? Where is it? I can't find it. Got shipped to here and it should have been shipped to there. Or I asked it to be shipped to the post office so I could go pick it up, but then it didn't. So it went there and went here. And it's like, I don't want to have to deal with like 50 different suppliers to, 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 to get this. So by having somewhere we can get the print surface, the magnetic sheet, these, the, uh, the stainless steel spring steel sheet and the heater and the bed and the SSR. It's like, it's a whole kit that you can just get, comes to you and it's job done. Not only that, but because it's high quality parts, I know that they're gonna be consistent over time. So because this is a test platform for me to test different pieces of kit, I want it to be the same every time I use it. I don't wanna to have to like replace the whole thing every few times I use it or every couple of times because something wears out or anything like that. So yeah, it's just a quality product that is expensive, but does the job really well. So if you want to get one of these, the website is fillerfarm.de. That of course is a German website. They didn't used to have an English section of their site, but they now do, it's all translated. If you don't, then you can still use like the automatic Google translation in Google Chrome, and that will translate the page just fine. It's really quite easy to use, even if you don't have the English option. So not a problem there. As I said, if you do want one of a custom size, if you're doing a custom printer, or they just don't stock the one that's perfect for your machine, you can just ask them and they can make them any size that you like. I will leave a link in the description below to the main website as well as to the specific CR10 kit that I got from my printer with this sheet, spring steel, bed, heater and SSR all included. So thank you of course to Philofarm for sending over this kit for this printer. It's been just the solution that I needed for this machine. Thank you also to all my Patreon supporters who support me monthly even in the times recently where I've not been perhaps posting as many videos as I should. So. Thank you very much to them. If you'd like to join them, there'll be a link down below to my Vector3D Patreon account. Don't forget to like and subscribe because there's more coming on the Extrudinator. Although this wasn't really an Extrudinator video, it does kind of feature the bed, which obviously is part of this printer. So definitely look out for that. Subscribe, hit the notification bell to make sure you get notified for when that upload comes. Follow me on Twitter and or Instagram for some behind the scenes stuff and things like that. All discussion on Twitter, I'm fairly active on there. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.